Coming up on Talking Points, one year since the terrorist attacks on Israel by Hamas. How the candidates for president are honoring the lives lost and the hostages still trapped. Plus, Donald Trump returns to the site of his first assassination attempt. See the special guest that he brought with him to his rally in Butler, PA. And the daughter of Dick Cheney campaigns for a Democrat. Why Liz Cheney and Kamala Harris say they're putting, quote, country over party with less than a month until Election Day. All that and much more. Talking Point starts right now. Good evening and welcome into Talking Points. I'm Jake Morrell. And I'm Luke Radar. We start tonight with an update in the Middle East, a day of sorrow in Israel, as today marks one year since the October 7th attacks by Hamas terrorists. 1,200 people were killed in, in the deadliest day for Jewish people since the Holocaust. 250 people were taken hostage, and 97 are still being held in Gaza. This morning at 6.39 a.m., a siren marked the moment terrorists crossed the border into Gaza last year. And sirens like those rang out throughout the country during the day as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a statement at the state memorial ceremony in Hebrew. Translated, he said, quote, We are not defeated, and as has happened time and again in Israel's history, it is precisely in moments of difficulty that great inner strength emerges. As long as there are kidnapped in Gaza, we will continue to fight. We will not give up any of them. I will not give up. As long as our citizens do not return to their homes safely, we will continue to fight. And President Biden is commemorating the one-year anniversary and condemning the brutal attacks that have occurred since. According to CNN, 41,000 people have died in Gaza this past year amid Israel's fight against Hamas and other Iran-backed terrorist groups. Now Palestinians are evacuating after Israel warned of a new ground operation. Joining us now is Talking Points analyst Michael Lamort with how the potential for wider war is impacting the presidential race. Good evening, Michael. Hey, good evening, Luke and Jake. President Biden is honoring the lives lost on October 7th while renewing his call for a hostage deal and ceasefire in Gaza. Let's take a look. Well, Biden, Biden wrote in a quote, we will not stop working to achieve a ceasefire deal in Gaza that brings the hostages home, allows for a surge in humanitarian aid to ease the suffering on the ground, assures Israel's security, and ends this war. Israelis and Palestinians alike deserve to live in security, dignity, and peace, end quote. And throughout the day, the presidential candidates, Vice President Harris and former President Trump, participated in various ceremonies honoring the solemn anniversary. Harris and the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, who is Jewish, planted a pomegranate tree outside the Naval Observatory. The tree is a symbol in Judaism representing hope and righteousness, remembering the lives lost in what she is calling pure acts of evil by Hamas terrorists. Harris has been clear about Israel's right to defend itself, but she has also criticized the Israeli prime minister for his handling of the war in Gaza. Tonight on 60 Minutes, Harris was asked about the U.S.'s relationship with Netanyahu. We have a, a, a real close ally in Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think, with all due respect, the better question is do we have an important alliance between the American people and the Israeli people? And the answer to that question is yes. Now over to the Republican side. Former President Trump spent the early afternoon at the tomb of Rabbi Schneerson, an influential leader in the Jewish community. And right now, he is hosting a remembrance event at one of his properties in Miami. Jake, Luke. Michael, thank you. Now coming up on Talking Points, over 20,000 Trump supporters gather on the field in Butler, Pennsylvania, where he survived an assassination attempt this summer. What the former president said to the crowd when we come back. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper.
Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Pennsylvania, we love Pennsylvania. And as I was saying, welcome back into Talking Points. That was former President Donald Trump at his rally on Saturday in Butler, Pennsylvania, referencing the moment at his previous rally there when a bullet grazed his ear. Yeah, Trump recounted the moments before a gunman opened fire at the rally injuring his ear and killing rally goer Corey Comparatore. Here to walk us through all of what Trump had to say there is Talking Points analyst Ethan Kraut. Good evening, Ethan. Yeah, Luke, during Saturday's rally, Trump focused mostly on his victimhood from the assassination attempt while also presenting himself as strong and resilient overcoming the shooting. Our movement to make America great again stands stronger, prouder, more united, more determined, and nearer to victory than ever before. We're going to make America great again. Behind Trump, you can see supporters holding up signs that read, fight, fight, fight. The words Trump echoed while being escorted off the stage after the shooting. Trump was also joined by many special guests at his rally, including his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, his son, Eric, and family members of Corey Comparatore, the firefighter who was killed during the shooting at the July rally. But Trump's most notable guest on Saturday was billionaire Elon Musk. Musk was brought on the stage while Trump was speaking to fire up the MAGA crowd. Take over, Elon, yes, take over. Uh, the other side wants to take away your freedom of speech. They want to take away your right to bear arms. That they want to... It's, we're, we're, they want to take away your right to vote effectively. Now, Pennsylvania is one of the most important swing states for both candidates in the upcoming election, and we will see Trump hold two more rallies in the state on Wednesday. Ethan, thanks so much. Elon Musk there, jumping for joy to be in Pennsylvania with Donald Trump. But we're going to turn now to this week's Talking Points toss-up state. Vice President Harris traveled to Ripon, Wisconsin, which is the birthplace of the Republican Party. There, she took the stump with a prominent Republican official who then turned Trump critic. Our Ben Bassick has the story from the Badger State. Hey, Ben. Hey, Luke. Thank you. Yeah, ousted Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney spoke this past Thursday at a Kamala Harris event lending her support to the vice president. Now, the endorsement kind of offers two questions for us. First off, why is a member of the GOP endorsing a Democrat? And secondly, why is Harris, quote, honored by the endorsement? If we look back to 2020, Liz Cheney said in a tweet she called Harris a radical liberal who would raise taxes, take away guns and health insurance, saying we won't give her the chance. But now it seems that she's done just that. Now, on the flip side of this, Democrats like Biden have called her father, Dick Cheney, the most dangerous vice president we've had in American history, calling for him to be tried before the International War Crimes Tribunal. So. Is it all over for show? Well, this announcement isn't happening in a vacuum. Over 100 former GOP officials endorsed Harris this past week, calling Trump unfit to serve. Now, Cheney's announcement took place in Wisconsin at the birthplace of the GOP, a state decided by less than one percentage point in the past two elections. Now, the most recent New York Times poll shows Harris leading Trump by two percentage points, still well within that margin of error. But here's what those Harris Republicans like Liz Cheney want to say to the traditional conservative voter. I tell you, I have never voted for a Democrat, but this year I am proudly 
casting my vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. Donald Trump was willing to sacrifice our capital to allow law enforcement officers to be beaten and brutalized in his name. In this election, putting patriotism ahead of partisanship is not an aspiration. It is our duty. So, Jake, a tale of two endorsements, Elon Musk and Liz Cheney. Yeah, same, same, but different. Um, I think there's a couple interesting things to point out here, and I want to start with Elon Musk, and I'm going to bring you here in a second. We were having some conversations in the newsroom about this right before the show. Uh, I think the endorsement of Elon Musk could work in some interesting ways. I, I think it's one of those things where it's a lot of people who probably see Elon Musk as favorable are already voting for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if Elon Musk, who's the richest man on earth, is really connecting with the average middle class union voter. Uh, that's how I feel about it, but, but I do want to bring you in and get your opinion here too. Yeah, I think you make up a great point where it can be, is he connecting with the average American, but he is the richest man in the world. He has multiple successful companies like Tesla, Starlink, and he owns Twitter now. And the economy is the most important issue to voters right now. And he brings in a different voice of a successful businessman who want, who is different than your average politician. He has a different viewpoint. And also another thing, as I mentioned, he owns Twitter. Users have said that since his takeover, there has been a lot more right-wing media content on there. Yeah. And so your average Twitter user now is seeing a lot more of those pro-Trump, pro-MAGA Twitter posts that they wouldn't have seen before his takeover. He's also been investing a lot in his so-called America PAC, which is investing in a ground game for Trump and these important swing states. But Ben, do you want to talk about Liz Cheney? Let's talk, talk about, about Liz Cheney. No, we do talked think, about it a little bit before. Do you yeah. think that Liz Cheney's endorsement will matter? It election? doesn't. Uh, right, Liz Cheney alone, her endorsement is not going to prove significant in this election. But this isn't happening in a vacuum. We just saw 111 other Republicans also endorse Harris. Um, Liz Cheney, she has no constituency. She lost re-election. She's kind of booted from the GOP along with the Romneys the Paul Ryans of the world. Uh, we have Mike Pence, who didn't endorse anyone, but said he's not voting for Trump. Um, but again, Liz Cheney on her own, I don't know if that's going to be the swing decision in this election. We have Wisconsin, a state that's been decided um, by less than 1% in the most recent elections. And, and, and that Republican constituency, those moderates, are who's going to decide that, that race. For I sure. respectfully push back on my friend Ben here really yeah, quickly. Because you do think somebody like Pence or Paul Ryan, both Midwestern Republicans, not endorsing Trump, do you think that would have an effect? Of course, I think they definitely carry weight, but we look at those Haley voters, right? Those Haley voters that are left now in Wisconsin. Haley endorsed Trump. Them Haley in endorsed Trump at the RNC, though, Luke. And we look at Wisconsin what, at a religious standpoint, 71% Christian, 53 of them not supporting abortion, 53% not supporting abortion. I don't know if Liz Cheney is going to be able to toe the line of faith with those voters and sway them over to support Harris. I don't think it's going to happen during this race. We'll have to see what happens. It's going to come down to a very close race in Indeed. our toss-up state of Wisconsin. Ben Bass like Ethan Kraut, thank you so much. Coming up on Talking Points, okay. what could be the final debate of this election cycle? Find out what voters thought of J.D. Vance and Tim Walls in 90 seconds. They'll test you. Try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait and move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up.
Welcome back into Talking Points. It's been a quiet debate season this election cycle. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump had just one debate with each other instead of the usual three. And that means last week's vice presidential debate was the last event with both campaigns together. Who would have thought the VP debate would actually matter in this election cycle? Who knows? Strange. Our Alex Burstein joins us in the studio to break down how Tim Walls and J.D. Vance's performances on the debate stage affected the polls. Hey, Alex. Hey, Luke, you're exactly right. Who would have thought? Usually the VP debate has no poll on voters. Its viewership is much lower than presidential debates, and by October, many voters have their minds made up. But this election is unlike many others, so the post-debate polls could matter just a little bit more. The presidential debate was seen as an overwhelming victory for President Kamala, for Vice President Kamala Harris, and it wasn't just experts who said that. Polls show that voters thought that Harris won as well, but the VP debate was much closer. It was a policy-centric forum, something that hadn't been seen in recent presidential cycles, and the viewers, well, they were split. It was basically a tie, a CBS poll show 42% of voters thought Waltz won the debate compared to 41% of voters who thought Vance did. And if you break it down by issues, that's where things get a little more interesting. According to that same CBS poll, Waltz had resounding victories when talking about abortion and health care, but Vance took the lead on economy and immigration. Does that sound familiar? That's because that's been the same story all election season. For the most part, it was also very calm and respectful, probably how debate should be, and voters agreed major favorability jumps for both of the VP candidates. Part of the favorability movement came from human moments like this. We are going to shake hands after this debate and after this election. And of course, I hope that we win and I think we're going to win. But if Tim Walsh is the next vice president, he'll have my prayers. He'll have my best wishes and he'll have my help whenever he, he, he wants it. Alex Burstein joining us at the desk now. Alex, you know, we saw how respectful they were to each other there. There was a couple moments where both of them might not have been as respectful to each other or the moderators. Uh, could you walk us through J.D. Vance's fact checking uh, notorious fact checking statement. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, Luke, I know you love a good fact check, but Always. JD Vance, not so much. And this is what he had to say when he was tried to be fact checked on the debate stage. Governor, and just to clarify for our viewers, Springfield, Ohio does have a large number of Haitian migrants who have legal status temporary protected status. Well, Mar 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 Nora, but, but thank you. No, Senator, we have no, 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 so much to get to. Mar Margaret, you, I, I think Nora. it's important we're because... We're going to turn out of the, the debate, economy. Thank Margaret, you. Margaret, the, the, the rules were that the you economy, guys weren't going to fact check. And since you're fact checking me... See, when you're complaining about facts, you're kind of losing the argument, I feel like. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. And he went on to talk about the CBP-1 Act and actually had another fact there himself. He was talking about how it's used for immigrants to try to apply for asylum. It's more of a scheduling act. So just a lot of inconsistencies with Vance on the fact checking. Well, speaking of fact free arguments, going into the debate for the first like 88 minutes, I thought JD Vance did a better job in terms of the debate. And so Tim Walls kind of had this kind of Hail Mary pass at the end of the game, former football coach, he would know these things, <laughs> uh, asking Vance directly. If he would acknowledge that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, was Vance able to do that? He was not. And this is the big moment that Democrats have yeah. been talking about over the past couple of days. Because of Donald Trump's inability to say, he is still saying he didn't lose the election. I would just ask that. Did he lose the 2020 election? Tim, I'm focused on the future. Did Kamala Harris censor Americans from speaking their mind in the wake of the 2020 COVID situation? That is, a damning, to, that is a damning non-answer. Focused on the future, Alex. Yeah, I mean, democracy <laughs> continues to be the big thing for Democrats, and yeah. that there is exactly what they want to hear. The future of democracy is what many voters are focused on. Alex Burstein, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. The Supreme Court returned to session today with a slate of controversial cases on the docket. Today, they released a verdict on emergency abortion access in Texas. Here with the details in his Talking Points debut is analyst Drew Marajasek. Hey, Drew. Welcome. Thanks, guys. The last Supreme Court term ended with a controversial decision on presidential immunity. Now, after four months away, the justices are back and weighing in on other big political issues, including abortion. Today, they sided with a lower court ruling banning abortion, emergency abortions that go against Texas law. Texas has some of the strongest restrictions on abortion in the country. The Biden administration argued that hospitals are required under federal law to provide abortions when the patient's health or life is at serious risk. The court disagreed, but did not say why. A few months ago, the court narrowly ruled to allow emergency abortions in Idaho. 
The difference between the laws in Idaho and Texas is that Texas provides an exception for the life and health of the woman. Idaho's law only allows abortions when the woman's life is in danger. In Texas, the state Supreme Court ruled that doctors do not have to wait until a mother's health is in serious danger before providing an abortion. We've seen abortion work as a winning issue for Democrats in red states like Kansas and Kentucky. There's a big race for the Senate in Texas this cycle. What have the candidates said about their state's abortion laws? In the Texas Senate race, Democratic Congressman Colin Allred is challenging Republican incumbent Senator Ted Cruz. He's opposed to the laws in his state and has made abortion access a centerpiece of his campaign. On the campaign trail, Allred has promised to restore Roe v. Wade nationwide if elected. Meanwhile, the usually outspoken Cruz has gone silent on the issue of abortion. He wouldn't tell the Texas Tribune if he supports the restrictions in place now. The bottom line is, if Democrats want to codify abortion access into federal law, they will need to win races in states like Texas to hold on to power in the Senate. Jake and Luke, back to you. Drew Matiasek, thank you so much. Welcome. Ahead of the release of her new memoir, former First Lady Melania Trump is sharing her views on a top issue for voters in this election and standing in sharp contrast to the views held by her husband. Talking Points analyst Megan Acker is here to examine Melania's new stance on abortion access. Hey, Megan. Good evening, Luke. Melania Trump's new self-titled memoir isn't set to hit shelves until tomorrow, but it's already causing trouble for her husband. Copies were obtained by a number of news sites, and in it, the former first lady details her stance on abortion. Melania writes, why should anyone other than the woman herself have the power to determine what she does with her own body? Restricting a woman's right to choose whether to terminate an unwanted pregnancy is the same as denying her control. Her views conflict with her husband's campaign rhetoric, which has been decidedly anti-abortion. Despite his attempts to sidestep discussions of his opinions on the issue, she also posted this video to X. It's a fundamental principle that I safeguard. Without a doubt, there is no room for compromise when it comes to this essential right that all women possess from birth, individual freedom. What does my body, my choice really mean? After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, Trump said the decision was, quote, only made possible because I delivered on everything as promised. It was my great honor to do so, end quote. As president, he appointed three of the justices who voted to overturn Roe, but he also has promised to veto a national abortion ban and says abortion access should be left up to the states. Despite his hesitancy, Melania, or excuse me, Trump has remained firmly anti-abortion with few exceptions throughout his political career. According to Pew Research Center, 57% of Republican voters believe abortion should be illegal in all or most cases, and several swing states have anti-abortion legislation that depends on Roe remaining overturned. When asked about his wife's book, Donald said he told her to, quote, write what she believes, but only time will tell if her beliefs resonate with her husband's voter base. Back to the desk. Megan, thank you. Coming up on Talking Points, Kamala Harris's media blitz will show you what she had to say on the Call Her Daddy oh boy. podcast right after this. Fancy pants peanut butter? A big screen television? You haven't even bought a sofa yet. A motorcycle? When your father finds out, he's going to flip his shoes with two buckles? What do you even need two buckles for? Mr. Big Shot, buying whiskey shots for everybody in the bar. From the looks of it, I'd say nobody even remembers. Feed the pig. Most party fouls are pretty dumb. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, 
You could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving. The ultimate party foul. Um, I saw the governor of Arkansas said, my kids keep me humble. Unfortunately, Kamala Harris doesn't have anything keeping her humble. How did that make you feel? I don't think she understands that um, there are a whole lot of women out here who, one, are not aspiring to be humble. Family comes in many forms, and I think that um, increasingly, you know, all of us understand that, you know, this is not the 1950s anymore. Well, this is certainly not the 1950s anymore. That was the sitting vice president of the United States on the Call Her Daddy podcast, which I found, Jake, I listened to all of it, to be the most substantive interview I've heard with a major party presidential candidate in a long time. Really? It was a really good interview. Wow. They talked a lot about issues relating to maternal mortality and to childcare and, of course, to issues surrounding abortion rights. But that's not the only interview that Harris is doing. We've got a couple selected here of the Call Her Daddy podcast. She's going back on The View tomorrow. She's on 60 Minutes on a primetime special as soon as this show is done. So keep watching this show and then go watch 60 Minutes special after this. And she'll be on my personal favorite, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, tomorrow night. What do you think about all these interviews that Harris is finally doing? I think it's doing? pretty interesting. I think it's almost like she heard the calls, right? A yeah. lot of people a few weeks ago were saying Kamala Harris hasn't done interviews. Mm -hmm. She doesn't sit down. She doesn't get in front of a camera. She doesn't lay out her policies, although they did that on her website. And I think she kind of heard it. And now she's doing it her way. It's not the traditional media blitz, right? Yeah. But we've never seen a president on or a sitting vice president on a podcast called Call Her Daddy. Now, sure. Of course, Call Her Daddy has been around for a good amount of time now. It used to be Barstool. Maybe Dave Portnoy was wrong about it because now Alex Cooper has got Kamala Harris sitting down there. Right. Uh, I don't think Portnoy has had a presidential candidate sit down, but enough he, No, he talked to Trump in the Oval Office. He did. In 2020. He did that. So he, he did, did technically that. have that. But, right, right. We, you see this whole new media thing sure. going on. But I think Kamala Harris is just kind of doing it her own way, right? Yeah. There is some hard-hitting interviews. We have 60 Minutes. That might be the hardest-hitting right. of interviews. And then we have stuff like this, which I think is interesting because a lot, I think a lot of people are saying – she might be preaching to the choir, yeah. right? Where it's like a lot of the Call Her Daddy listeners might be people who are already voting for Vice President Harris, but I think what she might be doing is just motivating them more, making sure yeah. they get up off the couch and they go vote. And I think that's something Trump has done with a couple of these appearances too. I mean, he was on with Theo Vaughn like a few weeks ago. And we talked about the Manosphere, and now she's doing, maybe it was the Womanosphere? What are we, what are we calling these, these string of interviews? I'm interested, this primetime special tonight <laughs> on, know C on CBS, to, for to 60 Minutes. I guess we're not, I guess we're not. <laughs> on, on 60 Minutes, Trump dodged a 60 Minutes interview, saying that he wanted an apology from four years ago when he stalked out of the interview with Leslie Stahl. Do you think Trump is missing an opportunity to do tougher interviews? He's only been going to friendly folks like on Fox News. I think he could be. I think Trump often struggles when he does tougher mm. interviews. Uh, you mentioned he walked out of that interview back in 2020. Yeah. He, he's had some notorious moments where he really struggles in interviews, and he doesn't come off as relatable, right? Trump is a very macho person. A lot of it is going to be about himself. When somebody pushes him on that, he doesn't love that, and he gets very, very defensive. And I don't think that's something that people love seeing in interviews. That's something that people criticized Vice President Harris about when she was on with Lester Holt a few years ago. And yeah. people pointed to that interview and said, here's why she's not doing all these sit-down serious interviews. And I think she kind of heard the calls and decided that she would go do it. I don't know if Trump would benefit from it. I know that he's done some sit-down interviews with local stations in Pennsylvania. I know Vice President Harris has done that as well. I think that almost might be a better strategy to really target those swing voters. But yeah. I don't People know if Trump news, would really Jake. benefit. They're big yeah. fans of local news. I'm a big local news guy. I know you're a big local news it's guy. Huge. Remember it's when huge. I called you Carrie Lake last week? You did. Do we need to bring that up a <laughs> second time? That Is that the again. second time we're going to bring that up in the show? I'm interested because there was an A1 story in the New York Times this Sunday about how Donald Trump seems to be slipping at his recent rallies, talking about how concerns of age that were once there for President Biden before he dropped out of the race are now happening for Donald Trump. They even had an analysis that said that he was speaking at about a fourth graders level. Finally, before we go, do you think that Donald Trump is maybe too old to be the president? I mean, do you think voters would, are going to have concerns about that? He would be the that? oldest elected president ever, yeah. so I, I think that's a legitimate concern for Americans. I think one of my favorite flips was when Biden dropped out because of age concerns, yeah. and immediately Democrats flipped to saying, oh, well, now Trump is the old now one. Now Trump is too old. So that's all the time we have for you today on this episode of Talking Points. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citrus TV News and like us on Facebook. I'm Jake Morrell. And I'm Luke Grado. Have a great night and go watch 60 Minutes.